Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today to this View on Africa, coming to you from the Institute for Security Studies, Pretoria. I am Fonte Akum, Senior Researcher in the Peace and Security Research Program. Today, we'll be looking at the political implications of this cloud of uncertainty that enshrouds Liberia as in the aftermath of the recent presidential and legislative elections. As we are very well aware, um, Liberia is 14 years removed from the end of its 14-year-long civil war. And if you go by that temporal analysis, an, a 28-year-old Liberian individual who was called to vote on the 7th of October of this year would have been very pre preoccupied by issues of peace, stability, and individual survival. The reason being simply that that individual would have lived 14 years of their lives through civil war and 14 years trying to rebuild after the civil war. Um, however, uh, the issues that we are looking at today are contextually fairly different from those that we saw leading up to the civil war and even that led to the relapse of um, Liberia into um, civil war again after Charles Taylor became president in 1997. So today I would like to go ahead and provide a brief background on the issues taking, uh, and processes in Liberia around the election. I would also proceed from there to draw some implications for both individual and institutional actors while providing a few pointers on uh, ways forward. I hope that would take 15 minutes after which we would go ahead and take your answers. Um, uh, just, just a brief uh, background on the Mano River region. As we are very well aware, when the war broke out in Liberia in December 1989, Houphouet Boigny was still president of Côte d'Ivoire, Joseph Momo was still president in Sierra Leone, and Lansana Conte was still president in Guinea, and obviously Samuel Doe was president in Liberia. Now, over the next decade, all of these countries have gone through different processes of state construction and reconstruction, which have culminated in a budding democracy in most of these countries, as we can point to the election of uh, presidents, not just in Liberia in 2005 and 2011, but we have seen elections for a new president in Guinea with Alpha Conde. We have seen election um, for... Um, Alassane Ouattara in Côte d'Ivoire, and we have also seen uh, elections leading to um, a, a new president, Enes Baikoroma, in Sierra Leone. So we have a decided move towards a certain degree of democratization within these countries. However, we remain preoccupied by certain hiccups that we see within these systems. Now, according to Liberia's National Elections Commission, over 1.6 million Liberians went out to vote in the dual parliamentary and legislative elections on the 10th of October. These elections culminated in sort of a tie, which basically triggered a run-up. A tie here in this sense is not that um, it was a 50-50 um, kind of thing. Of the 20 presidential candidates who um, were on the list, none of the candidates got the 50 plus 1 percent majority that would have averted a runoff. Therefore, according to the results published by the Liberia National Elections Commission, uh, we had George Weyer of the Coalition for Democratic Change coming top of the list with 38.4% of the vote. Uh, we had uh, Joseph Nyomai Bwakai of the uh, ruling uh, Unity Party coming second with 28.8% of the vote. And we had Charles Brumskin of the Liberty Party coming in third with 9.6% of the vote. I mean, if you do the math, Charles Brumskin has the percentage of votes that actually separates the first from the second candidate, making him 
pretty much a possible kingmaker in this process. However, ever since those results were announced, we had a number of political parties in uh, Liberia seize the Supreme Court, seize the National Elections Commission, first of all, to complain about gross irregularities that they claimed impacted the process. As a result of this, um, uh, this request to the National Elections Commission, um, we, 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 and the National Elections Commission's inability or unwillingness to address the issues before announcing the date for the runoff, um, which, was supposed, which was supposed to take place on November 7th, we have a situation where these, um, basically the Liber Liberty Parties uh, by with Charles Bromskin addressed a, uh, a writ to the Supreme, Liberian Supreme Court asking for a prohibition of the second round from taking place. Um, the Liberian Supreme Court finally statuted on this case and basically provided a writ of prohibition, um, holding off the uh, second rounds indefinitely. Now, um, let's be clear at this point, the sky is not falling down in Liberia. What we have witnessed is a certain degree of political maturity being exhibited not just by the Liberian people, but the political parties involved and the leaders of the different political lists. We have also seen a Supreme Court which has basically come of age within the 14 years in which it has been restructured to be able to like address the issues based on their legal merit. And while it's impossible to actually divorce um, the Supreme Court from the political processes that take place in Liberia itself, looking at the Supreme Court decision in favor of Charles Bromskin and the Liberty Party, it's clear that they looked at Liberia's constitution, they looked at the case as it was presented by the Liberty Party, and they stipulated that the rule of law had to be respected and based on individual vote and what was could be considered to be a valid vote, it was impossible or it was unnecessary for the National Elections Commission to proceed to announce a second round of elections without having responded to the complaints that were filed that, that were filed by political parties. Now, what are the implications of this decision. First off, um, we have seen the Liberian political landscape, and here we are talking about the political parties and the elite, um, pretty much break out into two groups. One group is the group which, the, the, the group which is following the litigation route with Charles Bromskin, um, and uh, this group is composed of Charles Bromskin, Joseph Nyomabwakai, who came second, um, the leaders of the All Liberian Party, uh, Benoni Ure, and also the uh, Alex Cummings of the ANC. So um, these have come together into one group asking for the rule of law to be respected rather than ceding to this process of political expedient expediency, which we just push the processes forward without necessarily having addressed the issues related to the past um, electoral contest. Now, the other group is um, George Weyer's group, of course. They came in first uh, during the um, first round of voting. However, it's unclear uh, how the voting on the second, how vo voting in the second round would be decided. Um, and when you look at their position is clear. They're remaining patient, and this is the Coalition for Democratic Change. They're, they're remaining patient. They're calling their constituencies, their voters, their supporters to remain calm and let the legal process take its course. Now, after the writ of prohibition was um, ordered, the National Elections Commission again um, declared the request by the Liberty Party null and void which triggered the next step of the process, which was very predictable, with uh, the Liberty Party and the Unity Party basically going ahead to the Supreme Court to really to get this process and to basically challenge the decision that was made by the National Elections Commission. Now, 
Uh, the implications for the Supreme Court are clear. Um, the Supreme Court is maintaining its role as independent arbiter and there is no nothing to point to the fact that the Supreme Court could be biased one way or another at the current time. What we are seeing is a Supreme Court which um, is stipulating its decisions based on the merit as they read and interpret the law and on the cases as presented by both the Liberty Party and the respondent, which in this case is the National Elections Commission. However, what are the implications for the National Elections Commission? Now, according to the National Democratic Institute, which is um, based in Washington, D.C., um, they were very prescient when their pre-electoral mission observed that the success of failure of these elections would hinge on whether voters, that is Liberian voters, have confidence in the process. And they noted that ensuring that voters trust require ensuring the voters trust in this process required transparency, inclusivity, um, accountability, and continuous engagement and communication on the part of the NEC. Now what we have seen as a result of the elections, especially in, as far as its impact on the NEC is concerned, is that the NSS luster, which it had built through the last two presidential elect election cycles in 2005 and uh, 2011, has um, a little bit been lost. Now, what, is the, what are the implications of the loss of this the, the next luster? It, raises a number of questions about its very credibility to conduct, coordinate, and manage the next election cycle. Um, for the political parties, what are the implications? By moving the contestation in the political, from the purely political arena in the public sphere to the Supreme Court, there are many ways in which looking at sociologies of power in Liberia, in a country within which access to justice still remains an issue or a big problem uh, for everyday Liberians. The question arises as to whether moving it to the Supreme Court would actually generate the kind of trust that it's needed in Liberia's society today to move forward. However, the political parties have exhibited over the past two years of campaigning, pretty much. I mean, the campaigning has not been for two years, okay. Um, but they have been in preparation mode for succession. Um, and in, during this period, what we have witnessed is political parties which have come together, as they did in September 2016 in Ganta, when the opposition political parties came together to form sort of a, a block against the unity party. What we are seeing after the elections is that that block has definitely been, been splintered with George Weyer's side incorporating um, the head of the MDR, uh, Prince Johnson, and Boakai's side incorporating Bromskin, Ure, and Cummings. Now, these two sides show clearly that they can create alliances, they can mobilize, and they could focus on a cause. The cause which they actually should be focusing on at the moment should be managing the electoral crisis and um, working within their specific constituencies to push things forward. They have equally proven that it's possible for dialogue to reach consensus around specific peace and security related issues. And that was evident in the Farmington River uh, Declaration, where all the political parties in Liberia pledged to remain peaceful and non-violent in the wake of the election results. So Liberia has definitely built infrastructures for peace, both at the grassroots level, the gatekeeper level, and at the top level. So these infrastructures for peace would need to be deployed as part of a collective com uh, conflict management mechanism over the next few weeks. Of course, um, uh, my time is almost running up. Uh, the, the, the metaphorical elephant in the room remains Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the incumbent president. Now, what is her position on all of this? She remained very silent through the entire voting period 
and even the period between voting and when the elections results were were proclaimed. However, um, when accusations started flying about her potential role in the background to influence the elections, she came out to discredit that claim, saying there were basically claims being made by agent provocateur. So um, she could actually still play a role in securing her legacy by pushing for a peaceful and comprehensive resolution to the issues as we see them today. Um, during the question and answer session, we could obviously look at what happens with the Liberian constitutions, we, constitution when, as we are sitting 40 days before Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's term runs out on the 15th of January 2018. Now, in the absence of a new president, what, what, what provisions exist in the constitution? The simple answer is this. There is no provision in the Liberian constitution for succession in the case of a political stalemate. What is being debated in Liberia's political space at the moment is the potential for a transitional government. But obviously, questions remain about the form, the structure, and the powers that this possible transitional government would be able to have in managing a transition from Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to her successor.